And we are live. Hello and welcome to Pursuit of Perfect System and another live stream video. And thanks very much for joining me live if you are. And also thanks to you if you are watching this video at a later date. And this is going to be a really, really interesting one because I've got a special guest coming on the show with me today. And as always with these types of live stream videos, the whole purpose of them is to be interactive. So get involved, ask questions as we work through. There's bound to be some things and some topics that come up that you're interested in, you'd like to know more about. So ask your questions in the chat section. And at the end of the video, we'll do a Q&A type session where we can go through the questions. So I'm going to introduce today's special guest, which is Lee Taylor of Lee uh, of Lima Acoustics. Lee, how you doing? Oh yeah, hello everybody. Firstly, thanks very much for coming on the show and joining me. Really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. So let me quickly make a change. Here we go. And we can be on the show together. So there's going to be a lot of things that I want to ask you, Lee, and work through because you've got a really interesting history. We've just been discussing, obviously, before the show in terms of you know, what, what you've done in terms of your life, the sound engineering that you've done, and then the hi-fi engineering and business, obviously, that you that you own and run at the moment. But, yeah, the, the title of the video is, yeah, what is, or what would it be like to build a perfect amplifier? Is it even possible? What would it look like? And I thought I would extend that question out a little bit because, obviously, Lima Acoustics makes more than just amplifiers. So, yeah, what would... Is it possible to build a perfect amplifier, perfect speakers, perfect streamer, and what would that look like to you? Uh, well, obviously, it'd have a Lima badge on it, all, wouldn't it? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's, uh, it depends what you want from a hi-fi system, what you expect, uh, what kind of music you listen to, to some extent. Um, I mean, I always think back, for me, the reference system uh, was my father's, which I built with him. Uh, we had uh, stacked quadrilaterostatics, uh, which was quite quite a, a forward thing back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and we ripped up the floor in the living room and built, built a Tractrix horn sub under the floor, wow. uh, which which was quite a fabulous thing, <laughs> uh, which was driven by a Crown amplifier, ex-naval uh, American amplifier valve, uh, the dirty great uh, 110 to 240 transformer printed on the side. Uh, and that was a fantastic system, really dynamic, um, bass response unheard of back in those days, you know, uh, but all fed from vinyl or tape. Uh, actually, we had a Tambo tape machine, uh, and I think it was a Goldring GL75 cartridge, um, a soy turntable. So yeah. for me, that was a real reference, which I've carried forward for the rest of my life. Um, I, I, I think what for me, uh, and I'm a musician as well, is to get that feeling of excitement from the music, um, which only a good and powerful system can do. I'm not much of one for small systems. I never really get that kind of feeling. I want something that's gonna shake the room. Um, so the more power, the better, uh, but neutrality is really key for me with the system. Um, because like a lot of people, I'll listen to anything from Lady Gaga to Mozart to you know, uh, choirs, organ music I'm quite into now. Um, so that needs a big, powerful, uh, neutral system. So so in terms of, I suppose, if it was you was building one, so building building an amplifier to be totally neutral and totally powerful, what what, what would differentiate one from another? What, what would make one more perfect? You know, in inverted commas, obviously, I don't know if you can build perfection, but what would make one more perfect than another one? Well, there there, there is... Um, and central truth with amplifiers is that um, you can measure them as much as you like. And you can get two amplifiers with different topologies that measure identically. They will sound completely different. Um, so no, no particular topology or design, class A, class AB, class D, um, is a perfect amplifier. Um, I, I am a great proponent of Class D nowadays. I think that's a technology that has marched forward quite nicely in the background. I know it had a lot of uh, negativity, about, negativity about it uh, a few years ago, but some of the modern Class D amps are superb with, with technical specifications that a Class AB amplifier would be very hard to match. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that Class D is definitely the way forward. 
Um, I think that AB amplifiers are great. I, I, I love them. Uh, and for medium power, they're terrific. But if you want a lot of power, then I think Class D is going to be the way we're all going to have to go. Principally, also, that they are far greener, uh, which is something as manufacturers we all have to think about. Well, I suppose that that there falls into the, the the world of reality against maybe kind of a, a dream system where can you have both? Obviously, with you know the real world life constraints, domestic domestic constraints, power consumption constraints. That's all you yeah. know for the future. It's all changing, isn't it? Which is really really interesting. <clears throat> and when I, mean, I haven't spent that much time with the different class D uh, amplifiers that exist on the market, but it does seem like there's a bit of a push coming through at the moment um, for different class D designs. I think there must be different designs and different technologies. So is, is that because of that reason, because of efficiency? Yeah, efficiency, um, heat generation. So you can get much more power out of, much more power out of a small amplifier because you're not trying to lose so much heat, uh, which helps a lot. I mean, I think uh, I remember you did a very good review uh, and very positive review of our little um, elements integrated amplifier. What, the Mighty Mouse? I think you quite like that. <laughs> the Mighty Mouse, that's yeah, the one. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a Class D design. Well, well, I tweaked it was a Class D design, and I think I asked a question about that, but only because of it wasn't generating heat, if that makes sense. It was only that aspect yeah. of it. It wasn't the sound so much. It was the, oh, wow, well, this is not getting hot. Why is this not getting hot? Oh, it must be you know, a Class D design. That's the, that's the only reason that I, I would have said that. So it's there was no sonic characteristic to it, which made me think, oh, wow, that's Class D. So that's, um, no. I thought that probably is a thing of the past. Um, but that doesn't mean a, a class, a pure Class A amplifier is bad either. You know, it's, it's. It, I was going to ask you about that. What would, what would differentiate one amplifier from another from a sound point of view? So is it, I was going to ask you, you know, is, is, would it be a Class A versus Class D or would it be components or design? Well, you know, many years ago, I had a conversation with Tim de Parapuccini, um, and he said that it doesn't matter about the topology or the technology. You can make any type of amplifier sound like any other type of amplifier. So you can technically make a Class A amplifier or a Class D amplifier sound like a Class A if you want to. Um, so that in many ways, um, there are decisions about the sound ultimately that are made along with the technology, but you're not bound to them. You know, if, if you want to make a Class D amplifier that sounds nice and smooth and very AB or, or Class A, then it's perfectly feasible to do it. So that's where it comes into design choices and, and sound preferences yeah. as opposed to a, exactly. ca a category of sound dictated by the design technology. Okay, that's interesting. Exactly. Take in, in our case with, with Lima, we try, uh, just, just, sorry, just to try and wrap that up a bit, we, just, we, we try to ensure that whichever technology we use, we have a, a house sound. Now... Uh, part of our goal is to have no sound, actually, um, but we try to make sure that all the amplifiers sound family. You, you don't you don't buy one from one range and it sounds radically different to, yeah. to something from the constellation range. You know, we try to keep it all within a, a, a general similar sound. Well, I want to discuss you, the product ranges with you in a little bit, Lee, but I'll cover a couple of topics first, obviously, if we can. Just taking that question mm -hmm. just a little bit further in terms of you know obviously we had a chat before and you was obviously very interested in speakers which obviously everybody's interested in speakers so i thought that would be a great topic to to discuss as well so t taking it further what, what would be a perfect speaker to you and you know can you build a perfect speaker well a perfect speaker for me would be to reproduce exactly what's coming out of the amplifier um <laughs> technically quite difficult to do um, and, and of all the elements in a hi-fi system, the speaker has the most effect or on the sound. You know, I think you've probably found this yourself when you do speaker uh, reviews and speaker lineups. You know, changing a pair of speakers radically changes the sound mm. uh, of the rest of the system. Um, for me, a perfect speaker is one that goes damn loud. Um, I, I like to listen to music very loud. Uh, I. I don't like them to be too big um, because I tend to find that really big speakers tend to suffer a bit in the imaging. Not always the case, but, but that's often. Uh, do, you think, do you think that's affected the by, by a room size? You know, obviously, because sometimes you see very small speakers in very big rooms and, and, and vice versa, very big yeah. speakers in very small rooms. And it can be, I'm sure it can be made to work either way around, but. You know, the, the bigger the room, sometimes it, it seems to justify a bigger speaker, doesn't it, really? And obviously the opposite the other way around. So um, what, what's your experience on that, do you think, Lee? Well, well often, often with a bigger room, 
you are physically sitting further away from the speakers. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they have to generate more SPL for you to get the same uh, volume where you're sitting. Um, I, I have been to small rooms with very large speakers, but if they're well damped and well controlled, they work fine. It can work, it's yeah. it's only tends to be speakers which are a bit up in the bottom end that tend to set off the room uh, resonances, and you get this kind of overpowering kind of woomphy sound. I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah, yeah. But if the speaker is properly designed uh, and well controlled and acoustically fairly flat and bottom end, then generally it's not too bad, uh, and you don't stick them too close to the corners, which gives you a base lift which you don't. Want. Yeah, of course. Well, look, obviously that was really interesting, but I think your background is even more interesting than that, Lee, to be honest, because let, let me just look at this. So you've basically worked in sound engineering at the BBC for decades. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so for a really long yeah, time. In, 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 I mean, if you if you want to go back before then, I left um, school and I worked for a company called Theatre Projects in London, um, which was at that time... Uh, the largest theatre and mobile PA company and lighting company uh, in the UK. Um, and I spent from 1977 to 1980 uh, doing West End shows or touring around the world with rock bands. Oh, wow. So um, you started in so, live, so, live PA, live... Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's it called? Live... I can't think of the name of it. It's... Um, <clears throat> it like live PA, sound? mostly. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah sound, re sound reinforcement, I think that was, they call yeah, it. Yeah, that's probably what I was looking for, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I, was, I was touring around with people like Boontown Rats um, and ELO, um, oh, wow. and then in 1980 I got an opportunity to join the BBC and did, um, so, and I worked there till 94. So obviously in terms of, we, I know we spoke about this off camera, but in, in terms of the work you did, I'm just going to throw this image up because this is a really, really interesting image. So the, the work you yeah. did, at, uh, sound engineering work you did at the BBC, just give us a breakdown of kind of the breadth and depth and involvement and I suppose what you was doing and, and what life was like working there. Okay. Well, um, I mean, the BBC, the, the best thing about working there was the sheer variety of work that you did. You, you, from day to day, you could be working on, um, something like Blue Peter or as well, or magazine programs, or the really exciting stuff, which is stuff like Nationwide. I guess half your viewers won't know what that was, uh, but that was a program that was compiled on the day for broadcast live every day at six o'clock. Um, so uh, no mistakes, you know. <laughs> if you were doing an insert for that, it had to be done right. Uh, and programs like Panorama, they were often being produced. Um, I mean, Panorama, they used to break into two roles. Uh, Role one will be being broadcast while you're still mixing role two. Oh, you know, wow. that's, that's how tight that sometimes got. Um, so, so you had that kind of really immediate TV, or you come in and do uh, a high-end drama, uh, and you'd have weeks to do it, completely completely different. And that was really exciting. Um, and, and certainly when I first joined the BBC, the great thing about it was that um, the real emphasis was that it had to be done as best as it could possibly be done. There was no one leaning over your shoulder saying, you can't use two rolls of tape, it's too expensive. You know, so, so I really enjoyed that. And, and sadly, that kind of element of it eroded away um, by the time I left. Uh, and it, I guess it's a totally different organisation now to what it was then. So, um, but, so but, oh, sorry, so just in terms of, just to explain a little oh. bit in more detail what, what you actually did there, because what, what the interesting part is, you was doing the sound engineering for all the programmes that you just spoke about we just discussed so yeah. you said you was initially you was doing sound recording wasn't you out in the field and that developed into yeah. the actual editing and the mixing for the tv programs which i thought was amazing and then obviously the the machines oh hold up wrong button there we go this button <laughs> the machines that yeah, you that's uh, it. <laughs> see, oh, yeah, click the wrong button. so the machines that you we, we spoke about so ex explain that that work environment please right okay so um i mean i started off uh on location with a microphone on the end of a big pole recording things um, essentially, uh, at that time, there were very few, if any, mobile video recorders. So it was all done on film. Um, so once it had been shot, it came into an editing room, was edited, picture and sound were edited. And then the sound was presented on rolls of uh, what looked like 16 mil film, but it's covered in oxide. So it's actually magnetic tape, but it's got holes punched down the side. Um, and those machines you see there, the two on in the centre, the larger machines are, I don't know why I'm pointing at them, it's pretty stupid, uh, are two recorders. <laughs> and the other ones are stacked on top of each other, are replay machines. 
Um, and essentially, it's a giant multi-track recorder or replay uh, machine. Um, and each machine had a roll of this tape, and they were synchronized together and ran backwards and forwards in sync with the picture. Um, and through the glass on the left, which you can't see, is a large room with a large mixing desk and a projected picture and everything. And you sat there and you mixed down all of the tracks that that uh, were presented for the final soundtrack of the program. So v extremely involved, really, isn't it? Extremely involved. Extremely involved. Um, I mean, some of the productions I've done have had hundreds of STEM tracks, you know, 20, 30 dialogue tracks, 50, 60, 70 effects tracks, 30 music tracks. Uh, and then Foley tracks, which are additional effects that are recorded in a, a special studio. Um, sometimes on location, the background sounds, the little tiny details aren't picked up very well. So somebody literally sits in a studio reproducing all those things like footsteps. Um, obviously, you're a big thing, footsteps. So there are people called Foley artists um, will mimic all the action on screen onto uh, onto separate tracks, which can then be mixed back in to the final mix to give it all those little tiny bits of extra detail that would be lost in the usual recording. So I find all that really fascinating, the whole the whole behind the scenes process of what puts a, uh, uh, and I didn't even really realize the complexity of it until I started creating my own videos. And as I was explaining to you beforehand, what I do is extremely basic compared to obviously any of these yeah. feature productions that are, that are going on, but having a little bit of insider knowledge of how hard it is and how complex it is, it really it fascinates me at the level that it's done at and, and the, the the quality that it's done at. Um, obviously, looking at that from a from a from a leapfrog point of view, do you think your time at the BBC was influential for you starting Lima Acoustics and starting a hi-fi business? And do you think what you learnt there and that kind of ethos is has had an influence on how you design products and the products that you've made at Lima Acoustics? Uh, a massive influence. In fact, in the early days, we didn't really make hi-fi. We started off as a professional audio company. Um, the first product was a Lima Zen, a tiny little speaker. Um, Mallory, who was my business partner then, and I were early adopters of surround sound at home. Oh, wow. But, uh, there weren't really any home uh, surround amplifiers or anything at the time. Um, but we, uh, if you have a surround system, you have to have multiple speakers, obviously. Um, and we couldn't find any speakers that really did the job that was small enough. Um, so we designed a professional monitor called the Lima Zen. It's only five liters. It's got the same front base plate as a, as a paperback book. Uh, and that was our very first product. Um, and we bought them for ourselves, actually. Uh, and then we took some into work and some of the film editors saw them and other people in the business and said, well, can you make us some? Uh, and it kind of snowballed from there, really. And I think we made a thousand pairs of those. Oh wow! So, so out of curiosity, then, mm. so that that small speaker, the Zen One, was that at a time of all large speakers? Was that was it unique in that regards? If it being small, or was it what what was unique about it? What was the bit that people liked about it the most? It it, it made bass, <laughs> which was pretty unusual for a small speaker back okay, then. Okay. It was uh, it was minus six dB at fifty seven hertz, so it was okay. it classified as a class two monitor in okay. BBC speak. Um, but it was minute compared to anything else with the same formats at the time. So, again, was that in any way different or based on the LS358? Anything anything to do with that at all? Or? Nothing to do nothing. with the LS358. Okay. okay. That's the only I'm other small BBC speaker. On those. <laughs> That's the only other small BBC speaker I can think of, Lisa. Sorry, I, you know, that was... That no, no. I, I, I could tell you probably I, I've probably blown up more of those than anyone else alive. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so obviously, so Lima was uh, established in 1998. Roll on, however many years it is from then until now, maths is not my strong point. And you've got obviously quite a comprehensive product range, which I'm just going to pull up on the screen. There we are. So you've yep. got obviously Constellation, Stellar, and Elements as the three main ranges. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, and indeed. Then you, and then you've got obviously the Essentials Phono Stage, and then you've got different accessories. So concentrating on the three main product ranges, Constellation, Stellar, and Elements, what is the difference, the fundamental differences between them, and what would someone expect if you know, they had elements and they upgraded to Stellar or vice versa? What, what would you say in that regard? Well, the elements were designed uh, for somebody who really wanted that half-width box uh, thing. So it was quite difficult to make uh, products that stood out and had, at what we consider at the time, adequate performance in a box of that size. 
Um, doing a CD player in that kind of box or a piano stage isn't too bad. Trying to build an amplifier in that size with enough output to be impressive and to work well uh, was quite a challenge. Um, and I think, as you found out, it's quite a little beast, that little amplifier. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, a step up from that, and that's class D, a step up from that is obviously the, the stellar range. Uh, and you're moving into class AB at that point. Okay. Um, generally higher output, more facilities, because you can just get more in the box. Um, or there's more room to spread components out so you can optimize the circuit layout uh, better, which is quite an important thing. Uh, in our case, we try to squeeze as much in the box and as many facilities as we can. Um, so uh, in our case, there's room to put in things like you know, streaming modules in the CD player, that kind of stuff. Um, so you get more uh, facilities and, and generally will be considered a better sound. So, so really, um, space of the product allows you to be more creative as a designer. Is, is that what you mean? Sure. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It allows you to, to, to optimize everything. You know, obviously the smaller products, um, we always oversize the transformers um, because one of the worst aspects of cheaper amplifiers is the fact that the uh, output uh, sags under load because the power supply simply isn't up to the job. So we always over-specify the transformers. Um, so you always get clean transient response. Um, Moving up to the Constellation series, it's really it's the same thing but more. So when you move to the Constellation two Kano amplifiers, you've got room to spread the two channels out. So a two Kano is basically um, two mono amplifiers in one box, right down to separate transformers and everything else. Yeah. Uh, the mirror image, left right. Uh, the only commonality is the control uh, circuitry, which has its own little transformer. Um, so again, you get a, a, a step up in quality uh, and output. I mean, the two con is quite a beast. I don't know if you've had a chance to play with one. But... I've only played with the little stuff. You haven't, you haven't entrusted me with anything juicy yet, Lee. So... <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to Dan. I'll talk to Dan. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry, I've lost my question. I've tried to fault there. You threw me there. But, yeah, that's all right. Uh, that's it. One of the things that obviously I, I should know about, because as a reviewer, you, you should know, know everything, but one of the systems for Lima Acoustics is LIPS, isn't it? L-I-P-S? Yep. Which I assumed was a, a communication type protocol, but I really wasn't sure. So I was going to ask you, what is LIPS, apart from these? You know, what is LIPS and what is the yeah, benefit yeah. of what is the benefit of it to customers? Right, okay. Uh, Lima Intelligent Protocol System is what it stands for. Um, and it was a way of making really high quality surround systems or, or uh, for cinema or at the time it was very popular to have surround music. It's kind of dropped off a little bit now. Um, but there were no really good surround amplifiers available at the time. So it was a way of making a surround system out of separates um, where the volume and the input selection, everything would synchronize between the units and it did it intelligently. So uh, if you set a two Kano to stereo input, it would turn all the other amplifiers off because it knew it didn't need them. If you turn to a multi-channel input, it would set up all the other amplifiers, turn them on sequentially so it didn't trip your mains, um, and then set all the volumes to work in sync. So it was quite clever. So re really, I suppose that's what an AV receiver is nowadays, isn't it, really, in a sense? But obviously, that's all compacted yeah. into one box. And obviously, I've, I've always felt the more you squeeze into one box, in theory, you, you limit the performance because there's only so much what one box can do compared to, you know, eight boxes, you know, in, in terms of exactly what you just said. You space it all out, you can get more in. Absolutely. And, and especially with a, a home cinema system, if you want a powerful home cinema system, I, I know notionally some of these home cinema amplifiers are, watts per channel or thereabouts uh, but most of them can't do that all channels at the same time because the power supply isn't up to the job yeah. whereas of course if you do the whole thing separate it's, there's no limit to to the amplifier one is not limited by what's coming out of amplifier three they, you they're all working completely discreetly I mean, i've kind of got two questions here which are a little bit tied together so i was gonna say in terms of lima and their production and i'm going to throw up a picture yep. in a second of I think one of the new things that you've just invested in. So am I right in thinking that all EMA products are made in Wales or made in the UK? Is that correct? Yes, made in Wales. Uh, a lot of the metal work is done in England, uh, over the border. Uh, <laughs> all the production is done in <laughs> all the production is done entirely in the factory in Wales. Uh, we do all our surface mount, all through hole uh, development and everything is done in that factory. 
So in terms of, I suppose, benefits to the customers or uh, benefits to you as a manufacturer, you know, why, why build it all in-house and why not ship stuff in from abroad? Uh, control. Okay. Quite, quite simply control. Um, we have complete control over uh, parts, where they come from, accountability for all of that. Um, any need, changes that need to be done on the fly, we can do immediately instead of having stuff made in batches from uh, another manufacturer where those things would be very difficult to implement. If we want to do a small improvement or a small change or a part substitution or something like that, we have complete control over the whole thing. It's much better. So you can keep an eye on every every stage, which probably ties in with the next question. And there was something else that I thought of. I'm pretty sure I've seen different iterations of product from you guys. So uh, like a fourth iteration of a of an amplifier. So is that part of a development process of we've got we've got a design, but we want to continually improve it? Is that part of, part of a, a Lima Acoustics ethos, which was going to be my other question, really? What what is the business main it, ethos? It is. It, it is. We, we are quite unusual in the, uh, the product life of our products it is much longer than most. You know, a lot of companies, you know, you'll buy an amplifier on Monday and it's a different version by Thursday uh, <laughs> with us like the Tucano. I mean, the, yes. the Tucano has been uh, running for about 12 years now. Uh, it's quite a long time. Um, so we have the Tucano one, then the Tucano two, Tucano anniversary now, but they're iterative changes, not wholesale changes. Um, the products that we've changed most have been uh, the mid-range products. So say Pulse is probably the one you're thinking of, which is now Pulse 4. Um, there were three previous versions. Parts of the Pulse 4 that you currently have are very similar, but we wanted to integrate more things into it. Uh, you know, things like the Frano stage and, and stuff like that, obviously, because of the big resurgence in vinyl, that's quite a big uh, thing to add. And instead of trying to cut down uh, or make a budget phono stage. We decided just to put our uh, essentials phono stage in the box with it. And that works very well, I think. It's an excellent phono stage. This Again, this is a question I probably should know the answer to, but if you owned a, a, a version 1 or a version 2 or a version 3 of anything, are some of the products upgradable to newer specs, depending on design? Not now. No, they would have been in the early days, but, okay. but not so much now, no. Okay. And, and in terms mm -hmm. of advancements and changes in digi digital, sometimes people talk about our oh, digital is changing all the time. And, you know, I, th I think we're still listening to CDs now, aren't we? Which we was listening to 20 years ago. So it's not changed that much. But, you know, yeah. do, you, do you feel the pressure of trying to keep up with the change in, I don't know, maybe streaming is probably the big one, isn't it? The, the demand of streaming music. Is, is there pressure? Well, on we were very late. To to... Sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We were very late to the streaming party, actually, because as um, much as I could see the benefits of it and really wanted to do it, um, most of the platform or technology in the early days, I just found too unreliable to, to want to deal with. I got development kits in from some of the people that made the chips and other bits and bobs and took them home, and they just crashed continuously. And I thought, this is no way forward for a product commercially because our customers aren't just going to, they just don't want to live with that, do they? You just want to play the music, have a fairly simple interface. Um, so we waited until the te technology was mature enough, uh, basically, and then stepped into the ring with it. Uh, as regards high res uh, and all these things, yes, we are moving forward iteratively with that, depending on um, what customers really want. Um, I, I am not sure about high res. Okay. It's uh, a difficult subject. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I have a different opinion to everyone else probably uh, in the hi-fi industry because uh, I think absolutely that we should use 24, 192 or something similar for acquisition, for recording, because it gives you much, much headroom. In terms of a delivery format, I think uh, 44, 116 is pretty good. Um, but the vast majority of music that's recorded in recording studios and has been processed, uh, there's probably not a great deal of point going to higher resolutions. If the music is recorded as live, so to speak, in a highly dynamic way in a recording studio uh, without much processing, then sure, let's go for more bits. 
I think, I think it's where you get into a really interesting, well, we could probably discuss this for hours, but we had a little chat before on camera, didn't we, in terms of you know, co conversion of, of, of digital files over to vinyl and, and other bits and pieces and going straight from recording straight, di you know, direct cuts to discs or conversions in, in between in the middle. And, you know, it, I think it can get a little bit messy, can't it? it especially as a consumer, it, it can get a little bit messy. You don't always know where your music's come from. It, it could have come from anywhere and you sure. just press play and just, especially with streaming, you literally just press play and you listen to whatever file you're given. You don't, you know, it's not like you go and hunt down a particular version of a track. Maybe some some people do, but my experience of streaming is you find the song, you find the album, you press play, and you you just get the quality that they give you. That that's my um, sure. that's my experience of it, uh, which obviously would be completely different if you was hunting down a rare version of a of a master of a of a certain vinyl album, isn't it? It's a completely different animal in terms of consumption of the music. Um, Sure. It probably lead, probably leads us quite nicely into a. I've got, I've got a, like a two tier question really. It's kind of the future of hi fi and where you think hi fi is going, and that kind of ties in. I was going to ask you a question about wireless. Do you think wireless is a, is a thing for the future, or 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 maybe or not, or to certain people? Uh, which aspect of wireless specifically? I just always. It's, it's just when people say uh, wireless speakers, I always chuckle because I always have to plug them into the mains. So yeah, that sort of yeah, defeats of the object. But, you know, yeah. so they have a wire hanging up the speakers anyway. Uh, wireless, uh, in terms of transmission around the home and convenience and everything else, uh, as the technology develops, uh, it's getting better and better. It really is getting better and better. Um, whether it will get to a point where it will actually challenge a good piece of wire, I don't, I don't know. Probably will. Uh, I think it's highly likely that it will. Um, in the analog domain, it's difficult. Transmission digits around is, is easy in terms of streaming. Um, so if you're playing off an ash drive or something else, you're going to play it through your home network to wherever your player is. Uh, and that part of it works fine. It's actually t broadcasting stuff from the head to, say, active speakers. It's that stage of it. I'm not too sure about it. Yeah, stage. sure. Sure. Well, to, to be honest, at the moment, my experience is, is very limited, um, only because I feel like I'm a I'm a set in my ways audio file. If that makes sense, I know kind of when you know something works, you kind of drawn to what you know, and I, and I think that's one of the uh, that's like an audio file thing. I think you, you're automatically drawn to the things that you know well, the things that you like, um, especially when you're spending large large sums of money on on hi-fi components. I think you're definitely drawn to either brands you like or. Um, just a kit or com um, kit you're confident with, isn't it? Really, kit that you know well and that your confidence going to deliver what what you need it to, really. Sure, but of course, I mean, part of that is is that people are also attracted to technology which they enjoy, uh, as we were talking about before, vinyl. Of course, now I, I know vinyl is having a huge resurgence, um, uh, and it's interesting look, looking at my own children; um, they are all into vinyl. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And and music they want to keep, they buy on vinyl. Any music that's transitory, they download or listen online. Yeah. They don't have CDs. They've kind of missed out this whole level of technology in between. Uh, and I've noticed that a lot with their friends as well. It's the same thing. Uh, but they specifically enjoy the physicality of vinyl. They like the fact that you can look at the cover, same as I did as a kid, and you can, you can get the sleeve out, and you can read all the sleeve notes, and, and they, they love all that kind of thing. Uh, and I think in a way, CD itself, a uh, big disservice with those horrible plastic boxes. Well, it's interesting, obviously, buy, buying something physical and tangible, it definitely adds adds a value to something. I adds a value to the listening to music experience that you don't quite get when it's kind of a chuck away, if that makes sense. I can just download this or I can just listen to this and not care about it 10 seconds later. I think it's definitely a, like an investment, if that makes sense, an investment in in, in a piece of music or in a, in a movie or, or whatever, whatever it is you're spending the money on, whenever you're buying entertainment it's an investment in it isn't it really as opposed to you know for the, the, the netflix model for example i'll watch that today and, and care less about it five minutes later it's it's a different just a different thing well, I, I hoped with wireless products and, and the convenience of that would hopefully make it more broad and more easy for people to come into good sound if that makes sense and make good sound more attractive to more people which hopefully then is the hook product to bring people into more serious sound if that makes sense caring caring about how music sounds and how you know movies sound as well that that is my hope for that side of the industry so the bigger that gets in my eyes the better because hopefully it brings more people in in general well i mean look at the amount of development that's gone on in things like uh, wireless earbuds 
you know, some of those are pretty respectable. My my daughter has the um, the um, Apple earpods or whatever they're called. They're pretty good, you know. They're, they're certainly better than a, a, a low to average set of headphones were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so I think as as an entry, many people have those as an entry headphone now or earbuds. Um, they're already an introduction in be into better quality audio than most people would be uh, subjected to uh, a while ago. Right? Yeah, because for, for thinking back to my, my first experiences with, with some form of hi-fi systems, I had, um, well, I borrowed my dad's, like, funny enough, like these headphones, but they was big and brown, these massive, great big brown things that I used to put on my head that weighed about two stone. That was my first experience. Yeah. And then I think my first hi-fi system was some sort of, you know, five multi-CD changer that all flashed all fancy colors with the bass boost buttons and stuff like that. So yeah, that was rubbish. So I suppose really compared to what <laughs> youngsters have access to today, really high quality headphones at really affordable prices and really great high sounding hi-fi systems and really great sounding speakers for very affordable price tags. Really, the industry is, as, as a whole is in the best place it's, it's got to be in terms of attraction, in terms of attracting people, because there is headphones, there is affordable speakers, there is, you know, affordable streaming solutions that, that mostly sound good. You know, obviously it can get a lot better, but most of it sounds good enough. So I, I suppose hopefully these are hook products that are going to bring more and more people in over time and attract more people to good sound. I think we've been uh, heartened by the last few hi-fi shows. Uh, done obviously not any recently sadly um, but we have noticed a, a, a growing trend uh, that we see more and more young people coming in sometimes they come in with their family or parents but they come back on their own eventually and we've seen a lot more women come in which is a, a good thing so I think that the, the balance of interest is changing uh, and I think most of those people they're way into audio or listening to music was probably on their phone or a mobile player, you know, an iPod or something similar. Um, but don't knock them because many high-end phones now have very high-quality DACs in, yeah. and the sound coming out of them is not too bad at all. Well, you know? I, I even like the fact that phone companies are putting effort into the sound from phones. I know they even try and put effort into the the, the sound from the speakers of the phones. And and to me, <clears> that's <throat> all that's all good because it's all tr trying to point people in the right direction. That sound quality matters and it's important. Um, you know, not everybody's going to want to go crazy and, and dedicate whole rooms to it, like like I have. But it doesn't matter really. Some, you know, enough people hopefully will. Hopefully, enough people will put that in their life and, and, and care enough. Um, that probably ta no, moves us quite on to a, a nice uh, moves us on quite nicely to another question. So, in terms of the future of Lima Acoustics, where is the company going? Have you got any new products that you can tell us about, or is there anything that we can get excited about in, in the least? <laughs> uh, at least. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, <laughs> we do have a new range of products in development. Uh, normally, we'd launch at the Bristol show in February, but of course, that's been cancelled because of COVID. Um, so I think, like most other manufacturers, we're, we're uh, sitting on our hands a little bit to see where everything goes um, and not committing to a launch date yet. But we do have uh, a new range of products in the pipeline. Not only new products, funny enough, I, was, I meant to pull this picture up before, and I don't think I did. There was a press release that came out recently, Lee, which of this machine, which is, uh -huh. is, that, is that a pizza oven, is it? That is a pizza <laughs> oven. You've caught me out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I saw it, and I was like, wow, that looks really, really cool. What, you know, what is it? What does it do? And you know, why is it special? Right. That's a surface mount machine. Um, a lot of modern electronics, back in the day, you had big components with bits of wire, that went through holes in the printed circuit board and they were soldered on the back. Um, it's not that way anymore. Things are called surface mount. So the little tiny components, I mean, some of them are ridiculously small, uh, are fitted on the top and they, this machine places them automatically in the right places and then the whole thing is soldered on. Um, and there aren't any legs to go through the board. Um, a number of advantages to it, one of which is you can get the component density on the boards. Uh, up much higher, so you can make things smaller if you if you need to. So but what, what again, that's a process we do in house, which a lot of other people they get that done outside, and the boards are chipped in for assembly. We so do it ourselves. I can understand the benefit of making things smaller for for the elements products, which obviously they need to be smaller. But is there a benefit to making things smaller for bigger products? Uh, not necessarily, but it does if you go surface mount. 
uh, it means the assembly time of the print and circuit boards can be brought down considerably because it's auto automated instead of people physically putting yeah. components in holes, uh, which obviously you know, makes it cheaper to manufacture, which means there's a benefit for the, the, the uh, end purchaser because the prices can be kept down. And that also means, I suppose, you can manufacture to higher numbers, which means customers are waiting less times, things like that. Sure. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Um, I'm just, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to have a quick look through the questions, Lee, to see if anybody's asked anything interesting. Someone's asked it's about... getting a bit dark. <laughs> yeah, you are a little bit dark, but yeah, it's getting, it's getting <laughs> a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. I'll turn the lights up. <laughs> so, so, so I'm, I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but obviously someone from France has asked the question. They know of Lima Acoustics, but it's not so easy to, to get their stuff in France. So in, in terms of worldwide distribution, um, how, how does it work for Lima Acoustics? How, how do you get your products out to the world? Um, we have an international sales guy. Um, I do know we have a distributor in France. They are based in France. I can the details I believe are on the website. If they want okay. To know. Okay. Um, so we so we do we sell to France. We sell to most of Europe. We sell to the Far East. We sell to Australia, um, Singapore, quite a lot yeah. of other territories. So so basically, obviously, the chap's called Raphael. I think Mela. I don't know if I've pronounced that correctly. So the best thing he can do is go on the Lima Acoustics website and look for the distributors. Would it be look under, look under? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and speak and speak. Yeah, international there. section. Okay. Funny enough, he, he did ask a question which we kind of covered before. You know, do you think Class D will be the de facto design in, in 10 years' time? We, we kind of spoke about that before, didn't we? Um, obviously, yeah. I, I can, you, can, you can kind of see why it might be, but I, I still think that in 10 years, is that long enough? I still, still think there'll be some resistance for, you know, purely Class D. I, I think amongst uh, diehard audiophiles of a certain age, yes, it will be uh, difficult to convince them of the benefits of Class D. Uh, I think younger people are not so hidebound in their in their view of technologies, um, and I think that legislation will eventually um, make it difficult to justify less efficient products. Yeah. And if you're looking at a class A amplifier, you know you're looking at 10 to 15 percent probably of its power output actually making it to audio. Uh, the rest of it is heat. Yeah. Whereas a, a class D amplifier, you're looking at 90 percent of it makes it to audio and relatively little heat. So that's the way to go. Yeah, it's interesting in that regard. Um, well, look, Lee, I obviously can't really see any other other questions. It's just mostly comments and stuff in the comment section, which is really what it's about. So, uh, is there anything you'd like to maybe finish on to sort of say? Um, well, obviously, thank, I obviously want to say thank you, but anything you'd like to say just to finish out the conversation? No, I'm just going to say thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk. Oh, I, I really get a, get an opportunity to talk to people other than shows where they wheel me out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well funny enough I mean, my shows will hopefully you know they'll be coming back at some point in the near future I, I definitely am missing them I, I know the industry must be missing them because it is a chance for everybody to get together um, and, I, and I think from a customer point of view it is a chance for them to speak to the manufacturers directly and you know I, I get lots of emails coming every single day which you know if anybody's watching this who I haven't replied to the email apologies I've actually had really quite a bad neck and shoulder so sit, sitting there typing has just not been there for me for for a few days but you know, people don't really have the outlet. They don't have the, the chance to ask the questions about hi-fi shows. So it's really hard. So, you know, fingers crossed the world gets itself sorted in the next six to eight months and we can kind of get back to some semblance of hi-fi normality if, if there is such a thing. Mm -hmm. Conversely for us, the, not doing the shows, uh, is that we are a customer-led business. So uh, if there's something that customers are really wanting and a significant number of people come and ask for it, then we try to integrate that into one of the products. If we're not meeting those customers in that way, um, you end up being a little unsure where things are going. So, yeah. so the real value of shows for me, it, it is not the sales aspect of it. It's it's actually meeting the customers at the other end and and getting an idea of, of which technologies we should be pushing forward. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know what? I never I never even really thought of that in in terms of you know manufacturers using that in terms of market research, isn't it? Really speaking to customers, what mm -hmm. what, what what are their comments? What are their, maybe their complaints? What you know? What are they asking for? You know, I suppose where where are the trends? What, what are, you know? What do people want? Really, is the trend, isn't it? Really, what what do audio files want? Yeah. Um, obviously, everybody wants great sound quality, and they all want it for as least as possible. That's a given. But of course, <laughs> <laughs> we all do that. Of course, but. Um, yeah, and f funny enough, just yeah, someone's actually mentioned something which I think is great. I again, about the Hi-Fi show, it's about meeting people from the manufacturers uh, from a customer point of view. Cause obviously, the, 
you you buy into companies, don't you? As I said, if you if you spend a lot of money on hi fi components, it's nice to buy it from companies you trust, people that you think are reliable, and um, people that you think are putting their heart and soul into what they make. And you, so you come across Lee in terms of discussion here and obviously before camera. It's uh, oh, thank you. you know, very very serious and you know yep. very very interesting to come into hi fi from the sort of background you've had. Um, because we're actually this is something that we haven't discussed and I meant to bring this up it's we talk about referencing sound quality and we discussed it beforehand didn't we in terms of you know if, if you haven't heard how it starts how do you know how it's supposed to be recreated from an audio system so you are in a, in a very unique position had having worked as a recording engineer then a, really a mastering engineer a mixing engineer and then manufacturing hi-fi components for people to listen to that does put you in a privy position that other people might not be in um, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm always interested in what metric people use to uh, to um, decide what is good or bad sound. Now, maybe it doesn't matter because for that person, what they want is what they want, and they're happy with that. Um, I, I generally think that what you should really be trying to do is make things as realistic as possible. Uh, uh, I, I, I think there's a general view, and perhaps it's slightly like old-fashioned, but really what you're trying to do is reproduce the sound uh, of the music as was intended, as best you can. Um, the trouble is with a lot of modern music is that by the time you get to to, to play, it's so highly processed um, that any, any thoughts of it being a reference, saxophone are a particularly good um, example of that and recorded drums, of course, because they have to be so compressed and squeezed that they don't actually sound much like a real drum kit most of the time by the time it actually, actually, actually ends up on a, on, on a mix. Um, but if you don't listen to live music, um, particularly unamplified live music, I, I, I think it, it's a good thing to try to seek that out so that it kind of resets your clock with how things should really sound. So when you go back in to listen to a hi-fi or, or audition products, you've got much more of an idea in the back of your mind what it is you should be listening for. Well, that, that could be the uh, the ideal takeaway, I think, from this video, Lee. Obviously, it's difficult at the moment, but I, I've got a funny feeling there's going to be a lot of artists looking to tour and do shows as soon as they can because they're all going to be, you know, pent up at home, waiting to get out and, you know, no money, obviously, but, uh, you know, get out and entertain people. I think there's going to be a lot going on eventually when, you know, the world does sort itself out. So that could be the one takeaway for me personally from this video, amongst everything else, is to try and get out and listen to some more live shows and live musicians and live music. Um so Lee, you know, thanks very much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Very welcome. Very welcome. And I'll thank you. Quickly, you're welcome. I'll just quickly see us out if I can. So there we are. So thank you to everybody who's watched this video live. If you enjoyed it, which I'm sure you would have done, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and obviously subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. A huge thank you to Lee Taylor from Lima Acoustics for coming on the show. There's lots of other live stream videos that I've already created in my YouTube channel. If you go on the homepage, all the special guest live stream videos come up at the top and there's more planned for the future. So again, I hope you've enjoyed this video. There's going to be lots more reviews, demonstrations and all sorts coming soon. So thanks very much for watching and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Lee, still there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, that's Is that okay. Done, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Perfect. So oh, yeah, you you're much. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Very good. That yes, was, I, sorry, I had to do it in the kitchen. It's the only, it's the only room I finished <laughs> so far in the building. Well, it looks, it looks really lovely. It looks huge as well. It looks huge. Uh, this was the schoolroom, so I made it the kitchen. I, I 